Ahoy there, and welcome to a very nautical edition of Reading Aloud. This week, on the programme that boasts bundles of ideas on how to use books in the classroom, I've been cast adrift as we sail a course around one of Michael Morpurgo's most compelling stories. Also coming up, the staging of Kintsuki's Kingdom. Pupils turn actors after seeing the show and reading the book. More stormy scenes with writer Tim Bowler. I don't see why kids should be kept away from challenging issues. And I wax lyrical about dictionaries? Oh, that's not a dictionary, it's a poem. An exciting, life-changing, round-the-world family sailing holiday in a yacht called Peggy Sue is the starting point for Michael Morpurgo's story, Kensuke's Kingdom. Unlike my great voyage on Birmingham Reservoir, their journey is full of drama and intrigue, and a stage adaptation of the story is entertaining children all over the country. Kintsuki's Kingdom is the tale of a boy and his dog stranded on a desert island. It starts with a happy, carefree family sailing holiday, when suddenly Michael is thrown overboard during a violent storm. For a lot of children coming to see the show, maybe this is their first theatrical experience. It's really popular with the kids. Um, really popular, and you, you, you can hear it. You can hear this sort of silence during the play. And, um, and they get, they get really into it. Stella, come here, girl! Come on! Oh, it's so good to see you! It's so good! When I'm on stage, I very much feel like a dog. I just think it's a beautiful story, and it's perhaps something that kids wouldn't even think about. You know, I think it just takes them to a different place. Kinsuki, an old Japanese soldier who doesn't know that the Second World War is over, rules the island. This is very beautiful, very peaceful place. There's no war here, no bad people. After seeing the show, pupils at Clifton Primary School embarked on more work with Michael Morpurgo's book, collaborating on a drama project with a group of students from a nearby secondary school. Back under the water again. You get fun from, from doing drama in a story that hopefully will alight your imagination and engage to be able to read. They're engaging with the book through play, basically. They're engaged through the book through play, through drama techniques, and hopefully that will prompt them to go on and read the book in more detail as well. So through having fun with a story, it brings the book to life. My children, the primary school children, really enjoyed working with secondary school children because they saw a lot of the secondary school children as very cool. You want to be the grandma then? <laughs> so some of the children that perhaps sometimes get overexcited with activities like that actually were fully on board and on task for the, the whole of the morning when they were actually doing the activities because they enjoyed it so much. Right, you've all been working on your um, little scenes and your freeze frames. So, so talk us through some of the activities the children got up to. They had them doing freeze frame, so they were freeze framing a particular scene from the actual play or from the book. And, and they really loved that. It was, it was really great to watch. They also did quite a lot of improvisation around the animals in the story. I know orangutans move with their knuckles, don't they? OK, first. OK, so think about... You've got to think about the animal that you're portraying. Once the secondary school children had shown them how to do the orangutan walk, um, they were all really into that, and I think it was, became a bit of a favourite in the playground for about a week after. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, you win. Who are you? Damina, Damina. I don't understand. America again. I'm Michael. America again. Uh, America. Stella, come away. I go again. British. The English, yes. They really enjoyed taking on the part of Kanzuki himself, and I think a lot of that was to do with the accent, and particularly the part in the story where Kanzuki gets angry and shouts at Michael for lighting a fire. Um, they, they, they really enjoyed doing that. Damn it! No fire! Hey, you can't do that! That's mine! That was my fire! 
I think for the primary school children, I think they did need the play to actually understand what was happening in the story because a lot of the issues in the story are perhaps a little bit too old for them. And every night I get eaten alive by mosquitoes. I don't think I could stand another night of it. I'm going to go mad. I'll go off my head. They were very keen to read the book once we'd actually done the, been to see the play and, and had the workshop. Um, we had read the first couple of chapters as an introduction for going to the play, but after we'd done the workshop, they're insistent that we, we get through to the end of the book. And I think it's, I think it's the type of book that we, we enjoy in reading as a class, which is really good. And we stay with the maritime theme, this time in landlocked Hay on Wye, home to the biggest literary festival in the world. Writer Tim Bowler was promoting Apocalypse, another story of a family sailing holiday that goes disastrously wrong. The book is emotional because I think it's all about the way the world is in danger of going and my fears for the world. It's not a negative book, it's just a... a a book based on fears that I've got about the way the world might be going if we don't look after it better. Something hard knocked against the hull. Neither mum nor dad seemed to hear it, but Kit caught the sound. Then he saw a piece of wood drifting past to leeward. It was barely a foot long, and in a second it would be gone. Yet in that second, he saw what it really was. A tiny carved boat. On an impulse, he scrambled to the port side of the cockpit, switched the tiller to his right hand and reached out with his left to pick the model up. His hand closed round it, then he froze, holding onto the carved boat with another hand, a hand reaching up through the sea itself. And below that, an arm, a body, a face, staring up at him through the foam. And then it was gone, swept past and lost in the wake. The story concerns a teenage boy and his family shipwrecked on an island full of menace and malice. It tackles dark themes of hatred and intolerance. Tim Bowler pulls no punches for his young readers. I don't see why kids should be kept away from challenging issues. I think the future of the planet is absolutely serious and important stuff for, for young people to, to debate. And so uh, I don't see a problem with that at all. I think they are very, very intellectually adventurous anyway. And so let's give them this kind of stuff. We're always asking children to use a dictionary, aren't we? Look up that word in a dictionary. That seems to make good sense. It's all in alphabetical order, and then you find the word, and there's the meaning. But how do they decide what's a word and what isn't a word? How do they choose which words to put in the dictionary? Let's see if I can find out. Ought to say in the beginning, shouldn't it? No, it doesn't say. Now, I've looked at this dictionary, and you know, there are some words in here that when I was a boy, they told us weren't words. Things like moo or few and don't and can't. They're all in here. So when did they change the rules? And you know, I've looked, and they've got the rude words in here as well. So really, dictionaries aren't quite what they seem. And then again, of course, you get your language dictionaries. Here's French-English bilingual dictionary. You look it up, and of course, it doesn't tell you what anything means. Next to l'allée, it's got path. And you can look up path, and there'll be l'allée. But you know, my favourite, my absolute favourite, it's the old thesaurus. You can't beat it. You've got a word, and then clusters of words around it. What have we got? Crusty. And then next to crusty, it says irritable, cantankerous, irascible, bad tempered, ill tempered, grumpy, grouchy, crotchety, short tempered, tetchy, testy, crabby, curmudgeonly, peevish, cross, fractious, pettish, crabbed, prickly, waspish. Oh, that's not a dictionary, it's a poem. Someone who really loved language was the late Ted Rag. And this week, our panel has been reading this collection of his writings. Sonia, what did you make of it? I particularly enjoyed the First Encounters chapter. Right, these um, were his First Encounters... He did some teachers... research on teachers who were with young children 
their first encounter with the class and they set up ground rules and uh, had a pattern of the way they wanted their classes to run and each teacher had a different style and then he talked about who which styles were successful and which styles weren't so successful and I was pretty pleased to identify myself with these successful oh, teachers. Right. So you had a little bit of self-congratulation came I, to you off I the felt, back of I, I thought it was interesting that some of these things had come to me quite naturally and he had discovered these things through research. Winsome, for I you, how was it? I sort of walked through teaching with Ted Rag and in the Times Ed and in his various guises in, in research. So to put them together in a book is just really good. And, and I just think it, it's excellent and it should be in every staff room people to dip in and out of. Yes, the snag with a book like this is that it can be very bitty because we've got a set of articles over ooh, 20 years or more. Does it actually hang together? Is there a coherent line of thought, do you think? Well, it's called um, teaching and learning. So that's the coherent line of thought that goes through it. And it's good because you can just dip into one little bit, look at that. It's not the sort of book that you could sit down and read from cover to cover. No. It is a dip in, dip out book. And so therefore it, it works. And you, John? Well, the thing that teachers in their tens of thousands were grateful to Ted Rag for, and for which they honor his memory, is principally, I think, his journalism and his appearances on radio and television, in which over a period of many years he stuck up for teachers through thick and thin, and most of it was thick. And I, I know lots of teachers, and I bet there are tens of thousands more, who said the only way that I got through certain years of my working life was to have a good laugh with Ted yeah, on a Friday or over the weekend. Especially if they were suffering mad curriculum disease. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And the thing about his wit is that leaving on one side the last section, which is a, a collection of the wonderful journalism, a large amount of the straight academic research which uh, constitutes the majority of the book is, I think, rather dull. It's very conventional, hard-nosed, quantified research, impeccable in its methodology, in its acknowledgement of research sources, cautious in its findings, but actually coming to some deeply obvious conclusions very often. So, Sonia, do you think this is a book that you would recommend to your colleagues in education? Um, so, some parts of it, definitely. I think the bit where, at the beginning, where the teacher watches an, an old established teacher with an old established class and then he mimics the same style and goes into a classroom and thinks he can reproduce it and finds that he can't, is a good lesson to learn. So, plenty of nuggets here to share with your colleagues, Winston? I think so, and in this age of action research within the classroom and all of that, it gives teachers who, who are going down that route a, a, a good foundation where to start and, and um, an idea of how to go about it. Agree with that. There are a lot of good things in it mm. and of course he was a great man, a great champion of teachers mm. and we, he, we sorely miss him. Mm. Yeah. Time for us to sail away. One final thought from the late lamented Ted Rag, and it comes from one of his last articles for The Guardian. He was always a fierce critic of the education bill, and he wrote, to call this a dog's breakfast would be to insult pet owners. Bye for now. <laughs>